This video is brought to you by Manscaped.com. Find out more later on. Hey, 42 here. I think we can all agree that over the centuries, human beings have done some pretty extreme things in the name of faith and religion. In the late Roman Empire, ascetic Christians called Stylites lived in isolation atop of massive pillars, completely exposed to the elements. In some parts of South India, devotees walk across beds of flaming hot coals, carrying burning pots. Digambara monks practicing Jainism live outside all year round, without a shred of clothing. And Sufis celebrating the festival of Urs will pierce their skin with hooks and stick knives or skewers in their eyes. You might have had the impulse to do something similar after spending the holiday season with family. There's no doubt these acts are all a strange mix of impressive and crazy, but if awards were handed out for sheer tortuous dedication, they'd surely go to the Buddhist monks who mummified themselves in the name of their religion. Right, fellas, Christmas has come early this year because I've just been gifted with the new performance package by Manscaped, and it's awesome. Let's check it out, and trust me, your jingle balls will thank you. Firstly, we've got the Lawnmower 4.0. This waterproof cordless trimmer is built with advanced skin safe technology, which actually helps to reduce nicks and cuts on your most sensitive areas. And it has this cool little LED light, which is really helpful for grooming during those cold, dark winter nights. Now, gents, Manscaped is no longer for just below the waist grooming. They have you covered from head to toe, quite literally, with their new and improved Shears 2.0. Their luxury six-piece stainless steel nail kit. This thing is really nice. Honestly, every guy out there needs to be putting Manscaped on their wish list this season. I'm serious. Or if you've got a special man in your life that's been extra good this year, then make sure he gets the performance package by Manscaped in his Christmas stocking. Because for a limited time, you'll also get two free gifts. The Shed Travel Bag and the Manscaped Anti-Chafing Boxer Briefs. That's literally a gift on top of a gift, which pretty much makes you the best gift giver of all time. So don't wait around, go to manscaped.com forward slash 42 to get 20% off plus free international shipping plus two free gifts. Now, you might think that being mummified isn't all that crazy. As you'll know if you've watched my video on the mummies of Sicily, mummification has been practiced by many different cultures over the world for millennia. But there is something a little bit different about these particular Buddhist monks. You see, they mummified themselves whilst they were still alive. Before we get into how they achieved this bizarre feat, let's start with the painfully obvious question. Why on earth would anyone want to mummify themselves? It's definitely not to get a better profile pic on Tinder. Nope. These monks were motivated by something far more spiritual. The quest for enlightenment. Now, if you're not sure what enlightenment is, it's sort of like that moment in the Matrix when Neo stops all the bullets in midair and starts seeing weird digital rain everywhere. And who wouldn't want that, right? But. Unlike Neo, who preferred leather, sunglasses, and more guns than an NRA convention, the monks of the Shingon School of Buddhism in Japan believed the route to enlightenment lay through gradual starvation and physical preservation. By doing this, they hoped to become a Sokoshambitsu, or a Buddha in this body. The practice of Sokoshimbutsu started with a 9th century Japanese monk called Kokai, one of the most important figures in Japanese history. As far as national cultural figures go, Kokai was about as big as they get, and after his death he was known as Kobodashi, the Great Master. Whilst most of us would be chuffed to have someone write a biography about us, I'd be happy with a few nice words on a paper napkin. 
When revered spiritual leaders like Kokai die, the story of their life is called a hagiography. Any saint watching this video will know exactly what I'm talking about. Except Kokai's hagiography claims he didn't die at all. Instead, he climbed into his tomb before death and entered a state of meditation so profound his body froze in time and was protected from decay. Weirdly inspired by his example, many of Kokai's followers would go on to try and achieve some kind of spiritual enlightenment through the same state of suspended animation. Religious texts suggest that between the end of the 11th and the start of the 20th centuries, hundreds of believers have attempted Sokoshambitsu in the mountains of Japan. At least 17 were successful, that we know of, but the real number is probably much higher. And many of the bodies likely remain hidden, just out of sight amongst the peaks. The first known person to give it a go was a man named Shojin, who buried himself alive in the hopes of reaching Buddhahood. But when his disciples went to retrieve his body sometime later, it had started rotting. A clear sign he'd failed in his mission. It would take another couple of hundred years before someone worked out the magic formula for mummifying themselves. So, if you've been sitting there with a notepad and pen, patiently waiting to learn how you can dehydrate your body from the inside out, then lean in closer, because here's what you've got to do. I'm going to warn you in advance though, it's not pretty. Becoming a Sokoshambitsu takes at least 1,000 days, and some practitioners have done two or even three cycles of preparation. So, yeah, best to cancel your Netflix subscription and set aside a good 10 years of your life if you've got your heart set on living mummyhood. By the way, for any clarification of doubt, if ever there was a time to say, don't try this at home, it's now. Don't try this at home. Anyway, let's continue. To start, you need to totally change your diet. And I don't mean cutting out carbs. The Sokoshambitsu monks belonged to a sect called the Sogondo, who lived in the Dewasanzan mountain range of northern Japan, specifically on and around the sacred Mount Yodono. The mummification process involves eating only those things that could be foraged on and around the mountain which meant things like nuts, buds, tree roots, tree bark, and pine needles. Yeah, at least it's paleo. For maximum effect, you're going to want to combine your foraging activities with vigorous exercise, just like the monks did, especially in the early stages of your preparation, when you still have enough energy to actually move around. Oh, and if you ever find yourself feeling peckish, feel free to indulge in a few pebbles. X-rays of some Sokoshambitsu mummies have revealed river stones in their stomachs. Once you're living on nothing but mountain buffet and burpees, you should find that your spirit begins to become more tough and resolute. You should also find that your body starts to shed all fat, muscle and moisture. Not only will this make it easier for your corpse to stay dry and preserved forever, it will also rob your body of nutrients, so the bacteria and parasites that usually kick off decomposition on death will have nothing to feed on. Next, you'll want to get your hands on some bark from the Japanese lacquer tree, known as Arushi. In Japan, this tree is used to make the varnish applied in traditional Japanese woodcrafts, but the Sokoshambutsu appear to have drunk it in the form of a tea. You'll want to time this part of your process carefully. The tree contains the same toxic compounds that makes poison ivy so deadly. So drinking lacquer tree tea will probably speed up your death. On the plus side, the incessant vomiting will accelerate your <laughs> physical transformation into a living mummy. And the toxins will make your body even more inhospitable to bacteria and bugs <gasps> than it was before. Effectively, embalming you whilst you're still alive. One final insider's tip, try to source some good quality arsenic. Analysis of spring water around Mount Yodono 
has shown high levels of this poison, which would have had similar effects to the Arushi tea the monks drank, hastening death and making the body even more inhospitable to bacteria. Whilst you're mastering your weird new diet, the second austerity required of the Sokoshimbutsu was to be confined to the mountainside. Three times a day, they would have to clean themselves using cold water and make a pilgrimage to the local temple for devotional practice. Not a pleasant experience in the depths of a Japanese mountain winter. But having lived through COVID quarantines, you'll already have a handle on self-isolation, so just add in three cold showers to your day and you're probably good to go. After at least three years of eating trees, drinking poison, living in isolation and meditating every waking moment, you should be about ready to take the final step towards your personal mummification. Get your disciples, by now you should probably have a few, to close you up in a small wooden box just big enough for you to sit comfortably in the classic lotus meditation position. Then, get them to bury the box in the ground with a bamboo tube sticking above the surface so that you can continue breathing. Now, all that's left for you to do is to go into deep meditation and wait for your body to pass away whilst your spirit achieves enlightenment. To keep their disciples in the loop on what was going on, the Sokoshumbutsu would keep a bell with them, which they would ring regularly to show their body was still alive. Once the ringing stopped, the disciples would open the tomb to confirm the monk within was dead, and then close everything up again. By this point, you've done everything you can, and it's time to relax forever. Traditionally, disciples of the buried monk would wait another thousand days before digging up the coffin. If the monk's body was perfectly preserved, he would be hailed as a Buddha, and his mummified body would be displayed in a nearby temple. Today, there are 16 Sokoshumbutsu on display in various parts of Japan. The oldest and best preserved of which is a monk named Shinyokai, who is said to have entered a stage of permanent meditation in 1783 at the age of 96. Unfortunately though, if disciples dug the monk up after the designated three years and three months and found that the body within the tomb had not been perfectly mummified, the monk would not be considered a Sokoshimbitsu and would not receive holy treatment. Instead, he will be returned to his grave and sealed in permanently. He would still receive massive respect though. I mean, you kind of have to respect anyone capable of spending years of his life eating twigs and varnish. But the monk's quest for enlightenment in earthly form would not be recognized as successful. Soka Shombutsu was outlawed in Japan in the late 1800s, which means the last person to complete the process did so illegally. A monk by the name of Bukai died in 1903, but because of a change in laws, his body could not be exhumed for almost 50 years. Eventually, a team of researchers in the 1960s dug up Bukai's body and found it to be in amazing condition. If you want to see it for yourself, you're welcome to visit Bukai in Nigasa Prefecture, Japan. Sokoshumbutsu has been compared to other radical religious practices, like prayer pravisa, a Hindu rite in which someone who has no desire or ambition left, or any worldly responsibilities, commits suicide by fasting. But believers argue that Sokoshumbutsu is not an act of suicide, it's a form of eternal enlightenment, which I guess is actually kind of the opposite. And it's not limited to Japan either. In the north of India, high up amongst the Himalayan peaks, you can find the 550 year old self-mummified corpse of a Buddhist monk named Sana Tenzin. And on the island of Koh Samui, Thailand, you can break up your scuba diving sessions and magic mushroom milkshakes with a visit to Wat Kunaram Temple, which houses the body of the Thai Buddhist monk 
Luang Fo Dang. If you'd rather get your self-mummification kicks digitally and happen to be a Nintendo fan, you can go and visit a whole load of Sakoshimbutsu in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Those weird withered monks that sit at the end of each of the game's shrines are thought to be based on Sakoshimbutsu. As much as it's interesting to look back on the extreme and almost otherworldly practice of Sakoshimbutsu, you have to admit, the whole thing is genuinely kind of remarkable. Whatever you think to the beliefs themselves, there's no denying that the level of faith, dedication, and courage it must have taken to undergo the process is something kind of inspiring, even if the results were a little bit grim. Thanks for watching.